welcome to our program, Violence Free World. My name is Kali Ikwe. And on the program today, we're privileged to have two very important personalities. The Senate President or President of the Nigerian Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan, and of course, and therefore, the former Governor of Kwara State, Abdul Fatal Ahmed. We'll bring you those interviews, but first, the special report. Stay here. The raging tide of violence in Nigeria is proving increasingly frustrating as more dastardly acts continue across the country. Recently, the Nigerian army killed a key commander of ISWAB in northeast Nigeria, who interestingly was a very young man. A study of the age range of Boko Haram insurgents captured by the Nigerian military in the war against insurgency shows the predominance of young people among them that many of them are well educated lends credence to the argument that unemployment is one of the key causes of young people joining insurgents and militant groups. Strong indicators suggest that general youth restiveness and the Boko Haram menace is fueled by the fact that Nigeria, one of the largest producers of oil in the world, has most of its population below the poverty line of one US dollar per day. There is no doubt that when the youth have nothing doing, they resort to violence. Not only resorting to violence directly, it becomes easy for charismatic persons who have evil agenda to convince them to do whatever they want them to do. By 2015, insecurity had become critical not only to the directly affected areas, but all over Nigeria. Being an election year, it became a basis for where there had to be a change of government. This, it is believed, more than anything else, and Muhammad Buhari, the position of the president and commander-in-chief. Many believed his antecedents would be brought to bear on the war against insurgency in the Northeast and the issues of banditry, generally in Nigeria. Between 2015 and 2020, the Nigerian government had expended about $2 billion in the prosecution of the war and other security challenges. $4 million was set aside. What did they use it for? If those who are at the war front are complaining that they are not sufficiently equipped. Interestingly, why insurgency and banditry have been more prevalent in the northern parts of Nigeria? The menace of killer headsmen and kidnappers pervades the entire spread of Nigeria. One disturbing dimension to the crisis is the issue of ethnic profiling as people struggle with the challenge of surmounting this scourge. Virtually, all acts of kidnapping in Nigeria today are attributed to Fulani headsmen, just as farmers bemoan the invasion of their farmlands by the same group of people. There can be no denying that bad elements from among Fulani headsmen get involved with dastardly acts, but quite often too, people of other ethnicity have been caught red-handed, perpetuating the same acts where they pose as Fulani headsmen. Aside from the disintegration such profiling portends, it is a major distraction from genuine effort to arrive at real solution to the spate of kidnapping, banditry and other forms of violence. Interestingly, the quest for solutions to the challenge of incessant attacks on innocent citizens has led some people to suggest licensing of guns for private individuals. Proponents of private ownership of guns believe it gives citizens the power to fundamentally defend themselves in the face of attacks. However, there are perhaps much more people who believe guns in the hands of just anyone 
will only serve to compound an already bad situation. Rather than resolve the situation, gun violence would become the order of the day. Finally, accountability and sincerity of purpose on the part of the leadership remains critical to resolving the challenge of insecurity as we crave a violence-free Nigeria. Welcome back. Time to bring you our first interview, which is with the President of the Nigerian Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan. Excellency, you're welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellency, violence is increasingly becoming very normal in Nigeria, with the youth involvement being quite heavy. This is coupled with general restiveness in the society. How does this worry you? I believe that um, violence against uh, anyone male, female, old, youth, is simply not acceptable. And it goes against the grain of civilization and humanity. And in most cases, especially in Nigeria, the youth are used for violence. Sometimes during uh, electionary during elections or simply for some very selfish reasons. I want to appeal to our youth across the country. Never allow anyone, anyone to use you for violence. You have a future and your future cannot be built through violence. Your future, that guaranteed, desired, and needed future can only be built through peace, through harmony, through unity, and understanding. So never allow whether politician or anyone to use you to destroy your future, to destroy yourself. Because when you go violent, what that means is I don't care what happens next. That next is what is yours, really. The present is for that person who is asking to do violence. On your own, don't contemplate it. So, Dr. Lawan, how then do we stem youth involvement with violence? You should be far away from drugs. Because sometimes, and in fact, most times, we have violent youth because of the influence of drugs. Run away from it, and I will appeal to us in government and all the security agencies that whoever is found peddling the drugs that causes this kind of influence on our youth should face the law. We must be tough on drugs, especially those that destroy the future of our youth. Finally, what would be your advice to the youth and what hope do you see for them going forward? I want to appeal to our youth once again that tomorrow is yours. We in the National Assembly did our job in the, in the Eighth Assembly by passing the not too young to run uh, bill and the president graciously without wasting any time signed it into law. So you have a future in the politics of Nigeria. You have a future in the business and economy of Nigeria. Contemplate, work towards ensuring that you participate in positive things. And government, especially this administration, in fact even previous administrations, have tried to create various platforms for our youth to be included not only in politics but, but also in the economy of our country. I wish that our youth will build Nigeria better than they will inherit it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ahmed Lawan, President of the Nigeria Senate, for obliging us. 
Well, I've been speaking with the president of the Nigerian Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan, and the conversation will continue when we return from this break with our another guest. Welcome back. Time now to bring you our interview with Governor Ahmed Fata, former governor of Kwara State. Excellency, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Tension and violence pervades the entire nation today on the account of criminal headers brutalizing just everyone in the course of doing their business. First, it seemed like it was an affair of the Northwest and North Central. And now it seems like the Southwest has been touched heavily to the extent that people are now preferring all sorts of solutions and measures. What do you make of this situation? You see, for me, I've uh, observed a lot of things in Nigeria. I've seen that um, we create inefficiencies and then we later on begin to deal with the consequences that come with inefficiencies. And we try to see how to create solutions as such. It never works. As far as I'm concerned, cattle herding is a business. Yes, it's some people's way of life, but purely a business. And if we uh, seek to address this as such, I'm sure there are better ways we could carry on this business of cattle herding to levels of maximum benefit to the herders and to majority of Nigerians. It's about land. It's about water, it's about growing grass to support cattle, it's about cattle processing, it's about creating wealth from cattle management. So I don't see where and how we have allowed this to degenerate to security challenges. At whatever levels, at the national level, at the subnational levels, unless we sit and agree together that this is a business. As much as we have poultry farmers, we have fish farmers, we have uh, crop farmers, so also we have cattle breeders. These are all arms of agriculture where people can create wealth. So sometimes I sit and wonder why we cannot take advantage of the potentials that, um, that are available in uh, wealth creation, you know, through cattle breeding. Rather, we want to seek to use the weak areas uh, that um, tend to put us apart and we begin to drive this to levels of um, very serious consequences. Unfortunately, it's that it's generated to levels where it is almost shaking the very foundation of our relationship as a people. So to me, I think there should be some more seriousness put to this in terms of developing a much more robust uh, animal husbandry development program that will not only create jobs for the people, it will put more food on the table, but most importantly, we can take advantage, especially in the face of um, the All-African Free Trade um, Agreement that is coming up. The potentials are huge but we must take advantage of it. You know, we have over 2 million, 200 million Nigerians. Quite a number of people are jobless. These are potentials where we can create jobs. It's not about cattle, it's not about fullness. Cattle herding is a business. Why don't we take advantage and move this from the current levels of um, being a cultural issue by the fullness and making it a national wealth creation program so that we can create jobs for our people, create more food on the table, and make things better for everybody. That is my take. Now, Excellency, does this option of self-defense measures being canvassed, including licensing of guns for private individuals as canvassed by Governor Otom of uh, Bende State and Governor Ishaku of Taraba State, does it sit well with you? Like I said, you see, 
the levels to which we had allowed our poor planning for animal husbandry development to take us to has resulted to us facing the consequences of poor planning. And as long as you keep facing the consequences of poor planning, you will never get to the desired results. Now, at the next level, you have failed to organize uh, animal husbandry farming. It has resulted in people encroaching on farms to destroy farms, destroy other people's wealth. You have, it has resulted in issues of people carrying arms, you know, killing and maiming other people. So everything that comes with that inefficiency will be consequential on poor planning. If you take up arms now, you end up creating a much, you know, a much more serious tension that we have ever seen in the past. Especially at a situation where the current economic level is a bit low, people are finding it difficult to make ends meet, you know, angers have built up. So we've now allowed people to carry arms. You can see the level of incalculable damage that will result from this. So rather than uh, asking people to take arms, why don't you go back to the drawing board? See how we can convert animal husbandry into a potential wealth creating program. It's not about any ethnic nationality. It's about our people, Nigerians, in our different diversities. Our strength is in our diversity, but we're seeking to see the differences as a strength, I mean, as a weakness. Unfortunately, this is what is pulling us apart. It is almost unbelievable that in 21st century Nigeria today, people are talking about how to separate from one ethnic group to the other, from one section to the other. It's saddening because 60, uh, 60 years after independence, close to over 50 years after a civil war that attempted to tear us apart, we are still talking about divisions. We are still not talking about how to move things forward. Nigeria has one of the best potentials in terms of diversity of land, diversity of people, and most importantly, we have the working age. 60% of Nigerians are between the ages of 15 and 65, which is the working age. Why don't we want to translate these potentials into improved delivery of goods and services? Why are we seeking those areas that will divide us and weaken the fabric of our existence? You know, it requires us to sit down. We have the intellectual capacity, we have the people, but I think it has always been the levels and way and manner we select leadership that has affected the way things have happened. There are people that can lead this country and take us to the promised land. But we must be sure that we are selecting people based on suitability, acceptability, and eligibility. These are things that will change the history of this nation into better ways that Nigerians will live as one of the best people in the world. Finally, how do you react to the reality of corporate conspiracy, a situation where those we should ordinarily trust now becoming complicit in our adversity? Um, in fairness, these things are living with us. And like I said, these are consequences that come with inefficient selection processes. Once you compromise a selection process, you have to make do with every other thing that comes with that inefficiency. So this corporate, this corporate compromises you are talking about would naturally come in. And as long as we have not allowed an electoral process that would allow people who deserve to be elected to be elected, and we ensure that those who have capacity to deliver goods and services are elected, you have to do with the consequences that come with such poor selection processes. So we see each thing you keep talking about are consequential on that poor uh, you know, selection processes. Either you talk about bribery, you talk about corruption, you talk about this, you talk about that, inefficiencies, they will naturally be consequential on poor selection processes. When you don't allow people who should lead to lead, and you begin to get people who are not prepared to lead, these are the challenges you are faced with. And it affects every fabric, every recruitment process, either into the civil service, into the you know, into areas of security. So many areas of compromise will come in. And if you are very, you know, if you are very quick to judge, you'll be wanting to see that um, these are results of maybe immediate people that are, you know, creating these problems. But these things have been built over a period of time, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years. It's a build-up that has taken us to this level. For those who are really keen on studying Nigerian's history, 
you will see that these things have been building up over time. They've been building up over time. But they had not manifested in the past because they were still building up. Now they are manifesting because the economy has gone a bit lower than we expected, so people are under pressure. But most importantly, the population has grown. You know, we have an uncontrolled demographic growth. We don't even know how many we are in this country. So how do we even plan for the people in this country? These are part of the challenges we have to face with. I recall some years ago, a young man, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, a young man came to meet me that was going to join, the, he wanted to join the police force, that he needed about 5,000. I said, what for? He said he needed to give to the recruitment officer. You know, I was, it was appalling. The reason is because, you see, I grew up, my father used to be a police instructor. And I know how recruitments were done in those days. It had nothing to do with bribery of uh, the selection officers. So when you begin to see such things, it tells you that things are going to happen wrongly. And when you begin to see such things, you are sure that Nigeria cannot get it right. So it takes us purely back to our recognizing the fact that for us to get things done, first things first, just as been said by Stephen Covey in his book of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, first things first. You get things done firstly, and then every other thing will fit into it. But as long as selection process of leadership is weak, you begin to have weak institutions, you begin to have weak processes of carrying on governance, and you begin to see weak areas of service delivery. So it takes us back to recognizing that as a Nigeria, we must recognize that one of the best things that if we want a 2023 to be better than where we are today, let us strengthen our selection, sorry, our election process. The electoral process must change, must change to ways and manner where we must agree totally as a country that this process is foolproof. I'll quickly give you one. Look at uh, the 1993 election. Everything was strong, but nobody complained about the electoral process because everybody was sure that the electoral process was correct. It was option A4. So how do we come up with a process that everybody will agree with? So that there will be no controversy, there will be no... You can, you can argue on other things as, okay, the candidate was not duly qualified, he was not uh, allowed, he didn't, he didn't go through the primaries, but the most important thing was that the electoral process must be foolproof, enough to carry the confidence of Nigerians. So that whatever process, or whatever emerges from such processes, will be seen to be reflecting the interests of the people. And that is where correct governance and good service delivery starts from. Every other thing you see, if that process is done wrong, will be consequential on that wrong process. Well, Excellency, I think that's a very good point to leave it. At this point, I must say thank you very much for finding time to oblige me. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Well, I've been speaking with His Excellency, the former governor of Kwara State, Abdul Fatal Ahmed. Same time next week promises even more if you endeavor to be here. Until then, please remember to remain on the road to a violence-free Nigeria. My name is Kali Ikwe. Thank you for watching. No more.